Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Four weeks with the Lord's Prayer, and we have preached at last the great Christian debate of the ages. <laughs> forgive us our debts versus forgive us our trespasses. In one corner of the ring, we have team debts. The Presbyterians, the Baptists, and the Congregationalists, the Disciples of Christ, UCC, etc. And in the other corner, we've got team trespasses. You've got your Methodists, your Catholics, your Lutherans, and of course, your Episcopalians. And then somewhere in the middle, we've got these Enneagram 9 ecumenical Christians who like to say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and avoid the controversy altogether. <laughs> so, which one's right? Well, yes. Yeah, that's the Presbyterian I've ever heard one. According to the Bible, all three. Remember, we see the Lord's Prayer in two different Gospels, in Luke and in Matthew, and the versions are slightly different. Luke says, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. And then Matthew says, forgive us our debt as we have forgiven our debtors. But at the end, he has a whole new sentence that says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your father forgive you. So what's the answer? Yes. Yes to all three, sins, debts, trespasses, oh my. We have here three different metaphors for how to describe what happens when we mess up and when we forgive. Debts, trespasses, even sin, as I said in the children's sermon, it's originally an archery term. It's still a metaphor to miss the mark. Each of these metaphors offers a unique perspective on forgiveness. And each, I believe, is compellingly relevant to our lives today. So let's start in-house with what we pray, debts. Debt in first century Rome, the time of Jesus, was not all that different from debt today. A small group of wealthy people, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, made loans to a large group of people who are much poorer, living harvest to harvest, today's version, or that Jesus' time version of paycheck to paycheck, and they charge them interest. Back then, as now, it was very easy for debt to build and build and spiral out of control. One major difference, as we heard in the readings, is that in the first century, someone who defaulted on a loan could be sold into bond slavery until it was paid off. So we've made a little progress. But the Jewish community treated debt very differently. And remember, both Jesus and the Lord's Prayer are very Jewish. As we heard in the reading from Deuteronomy, for Jews, the purpose of lending was not to enrich the profits of the creditor, but to support the needy, the debtor. Jews were not allowed to charge interest on loans made to other Jews, and they were not allowed to hold their fellow covenant people in bond slavery. And then into this mix of debt and credit, the Torah adds two financial reset buttons, the sabbatical year and the year of jubilee. Just as the Sabbath day occurred every seven days, the sabbatical year occurred every seven years. And in that year, three things happened. The land lay fallow, 
meaning that both the land and the workers got a break. Two, all bonded slaves were set free. And three, all debts were forgiven. Every seven years, again and again. And then after seven Sabbaths, so in year number 50, you get the year of Jubilee, a special sabbatical year in which those things happened. The land had a rest, debts were forgiven, slaves were set free, and then all the land in Israel was returned to its original owners. The slate was wiped clean and everyone got to start again on equal ground. If this sounds crazy to you, that's because by American capitalist standards, it is crazy. <laughs> but the God we meet in the Bible is no free market capitalist. Our God envisions a system with safety checks and balances to correct human sinfulness and the market's invisible hand so that no one accumulates too much and no one falls so deeply into debt or poverty that they cannot get out. Now, that's all very lovely, nice, and good, and idealistic. And truth be told, we don't actually know how well this was implemented in the life of the covenant people. But when we pray in this prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, this is what we're praying for. When we pray, forgive us our debts, we commit to live our financial lives in ways that privilege the poor and most vulnerable among us. When we pray, forgive us our debts, we open our hearts up to conversations about, say, reparations and how wealthy white power structures can repay money to the descendants of African Americans who worked for no pay. About how we as people today can rectify generational injustice and heal generational trauma when we pray, forgive us our debts, we ask, what might Jubilee look like in our context? What ancestral homelands is God working to give back to the people to whom they originally belong? What hunting rights, water rights, what sorts of things are there that we who are not indigenous and help protect with we who are Indigenous American. There is a lot going on in this prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, but don't be overwhelmed because it can start small. And in fact, we are already doing it. Many of you have heard of the Taos Medical Debt Relief Project. For those who don't know about this, it's a partnership of faith communities who join together every December to pay off medical debt. We buy it for three cents on the, do on the dollar directly from the hospital. The families that owe money receive a letter saying, your debt has been paid off by these faith communities. Happy holidays. We've only been doing this for four years, but we have so far forgiven nearly $4 million of medical debt for 4,500 different house families. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in our bank accounts as in heaven. If forgive us our debts directs our economic lives towards the kingdom of God, then forgive us our trespasses does the same thing with our political lives. Politics. Trespassing is a metaphor for sin as a misstep, misstep, 
uh, crossing the line. Originally, it's treasonous passes becomes trespasses. A trespasser goes where they're not supposed to go, as Kia pointed out for us. Metaphorically, but also quite literally, which I know very well because in 2018, I was in fact arrested for trespassing at the Santa Fe Roundhouse. As you probably remember in that summer of 2018, the Trump administration instituted the zero tolerance policy regarding immigrants, a policy that separated thousands of children from their parents at the US-Mexico border. You saw the pictures of the kids in the cages. You heard the cries for their parents. And like most Americans, I was horrified. I know you were too. It went against everything I knew about being human, about being American, about being Christian. And I was horrified to learn here in New Mexico, a border state that our then governor, Susana Martinez, was willingly enforcing the policy. So I got together with a group of interfaith leaders and we went down to the governor's office. We came from various groups who were Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Pueblo. We came from all over New Mexico. And we asked to meet with the governor and her staff. They refused. So we sat down and informed them that we would not be leaving until the governor halted separation and began reunification. It took about six hours for the Capitol Police, reluctantly, to arrest us. We sang, we prayed, we danced, we read scripture together. And over and over, we read that passage from Leviticus that Cliff read for us. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We were charged with trespassing which I guess is appropriate. We trespass on behalf of other trespassers, of people so desperate that they used illegal means to cross dangerous borders in hopes that their children might find safety. It was a powerful experience being handcuffed, walked out of the building. I submitted to that arrest because I confess that Jesus is Lord. And I submitted to that arrest because Jesus taught us to forgive trespassers. When we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, we commit to following those holy words from the law of Moses. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself. When we pray, forgive us our trespasses, we claim our citizenship in the kingdom of God that is coming, which pays no respect to borders or nationalities, but is indeed an international community. We renounce any system that privileges one group of people over another. We choose a God who always sides with those he calls the least of these. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. However we say it, sins, debts, trespasses, the Lord's prayer asserts that God's forgiveness of us is necessarily connected to our forgiveness of one another. 
This is the only part of the prayer that includes a conditional phrase, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or for we have forgiven those who sin against us. Now let's be clear. Jesus is not saying that God's forgiveness of us is dependent upon our forgiveness of others. We would never be forgiven. As if God could not forgive us for our own failure to forgive. We know God is much. But the two are connected, aren't they? We cannot really accept God's forgiveness if we have hardened our hearts so much against our neighbors. Forgiveness is at its heart relational to receive forgiveness from God. We have to be open enough to offer forgiveness to one another. We who seek forgiveness must learn to forgive not just sins, but debts and trespasses too. Forgive us our debts. In God's economics, the priority is always on the poor. Forgive us our trespasses. In God's politics, a nation is measured by how it treats strangers. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us, because in God's kingdom, we belong to one another. And in God's house, there is always enough grace to go around. 